Welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani. This week on Diplomatic Channel, we're zeroing in on the treatment of migrants at the Spain-Morocco border. You may have heard by now at least 23 people died while trying to make it to the enclave of Melilla in Spain. But things turned awry when border guards got involved. I'll tell you more about it later. And my guest, human rights activist Olatunji Larry Barua, examines the options for these migrants and what governments can do about the situation. Later, in an exclusive interview with the only Nigerian contender for the position of registrar at the International Criminal Court at The Hague, you'd want to hear why Mr. Ibrahim Pam is interested in the position and changes he hopes to make from within. That's Diplomatic Channel in a wrap. Let's check in on other discussions in diplomatic circles, and we'll be right back. Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari has paid a three-day state visit to Portugal, during which he met with Prime Minister Antonio Costain in Lisbon. The Nigerian delegation led by President Buhari signed up to 10 memoranda of understanding, including the establishment of an Atlantic Research Center, air travel, political consultations, diplomatic training, cultural cooperation, investment promotion, chambers of commerce cooperation, women and child development, youth and sports development, and digital economy cooperation, signed on behalf of Nigeria by the Ministers of Foreign Affairs and Youth and Sports. The UK has announced a landmark deal with Nigeria to increase the deportation of what it calls dangerous foreign criminals, hours after the country deported at least 10 Nigerians for alleged immigration-related offences. According to the deal, people can be deported from the United Kingdom if they are not British citizens and have been convicted of a criminal offence. Earlier this month, the European Court of Human Rights cancelled the first flight due to take asylum seekers from the UK to Rwanda. The flight was part of the Rwanda Asylum Plan announced by the UK government in April that sees some asylum seekers giving a one-way ticket to Rwanda to claim asylum there instead. The Nigerians and Diaspora Commission says more African countries joining the diaspora to establish and properly engage their respective diaspora will catapult into continental development and growth. The comments by the chairman, Mrs. Abike Dabiri Arewa, came through the secretary of the commission, Dr. Sule Yakubu Basi. During the second study tour of the commission and other agencies by the Ethiopian delegation facilitated by the International Organization for Migration in Abuja, Dr. Bassi said it helps to integrate Africans in the diaspora to support and contribute back home and is as part of the national migration system and will be transparent in helping provide steps and processes to creating a functional, credible and accurate data collection system. Israel's interim prime minister, Yeri Lapid, said the country has intercepted three unarmed drones sent by Lebanon's Hezbollah towards an Israel Mediterranean gas rig. He made the comment on Sunday during his first meeting as prime minister. Lapid said the Israeli army intercepted three hostile unmanned aircraft that were trying to target Israeli infrastructure in Israel's economic water. There was no immediate response from Lebanese authorities to the incident which came amid tensions over the location of the Israeli rig and long-standing but so far fruitless U.S.-mediated efforts to agree on a maritime border. The Iranian-backed Shite armed group said the drones launched towards the Karish gas field in waters claimed by both countries had been on a reconnaissance mission. It said the message was delivered. <laughs> Finally, Russian diplomatic staff in Bulgaria and their families arrived in Sofia to leave the country ahead of the deadline given by the Bulgarian government for them to depart. Bulgaria's foreign ministry last week expelled 70 members of Moscow's representation. Outgoing Prime Minister Kirill Petkov said those told to leave had been working against Bulgaria's interests. Diplomatic staff arrived at Sofia airport by bus and taxis on Sunday and proceeded to check in for two flights to Moscow's Nukovo airport on Russian government airplanes. 
Russia's ambassador to Bulgaria, Eleonora Mitrafonova, said on Friday she would ask Moscow to close its embassy in Sofia after the foreign ministry did not reverse the decision. Welcome back. And now to a really important issue that has grabbed headlines across Africa. This video released on Friday and on Saturday, June 24th and 25th, 2022, showing dozens of people lying by Moroccan border fence, some bleeding, many apparently lifeless. It allegedly shows the aftermath of a mass crossing attempt of migrants in the Spanish enclave of Melilla, in which at least 23 people died. Moroccan authorities say the disaster occurred after migrants attempted to storm a fence into the enclave, with some dying in a crush, after what authorities called a stampede and others falling from a fence. And in the video, a large number of African migrants are largely closely piled together, their bodies overlapping and many motionless, and a few making feeble gestures with Moroccan security forces standing over them in riot gear. Now, Human Rights Watch says there were also videos of photographs showing Moroccan security forces kicking and beating people. And Spanish Guardia Civil launching tear gas at men clinging to fences. They have called on officials in Spain, Morocco and the European Union to condemn the violence and ensure effective impartial investigations to bring justice for those who lost their lives. On Thursday, June 30, a group of migrants gathered outside the UNHCR office in Rabat, the Moroccan capital, protesting as Moroccan authorities began prosecuting 65 migrants for last Friday's mass attempt to cross into Melilla, leading to the death of 23 of them. Meanwhile, Spain is shifting its policy towards Africa while lobbying the EU and NATO for support to address migration from the continent aggravated by the Ukrainian invasion. Following the incident of the 24th and 25th, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez blamed mafia people, traffickers, for the violence and fatal border incursions in Melilla. A una ciudad que es, bueno, territorio español. I want to bring in human rights activist Olatunji Larry Barua to talk some more about this. Mr. Larry Barua, thank you for joining me on Diplomatic Channel today. Let's begin with, you know, this story. It, it is disheartening, isn't it? Uh, people, no matter the race or color, would be treated in such a manner as these ones at the Malia enclave. And while regular migration is a problem, uh, will these types of treatments at the border, you know, the stories we're hearing about border guards uh, beating up uh, migrants and then, you know, the, the crush at the at the Melia enclave, will this help to discourage irregular migration? I don't think it will. You know, we have had a series of uh, incidences in the past that could be likened to a calamity. We've had um, an incident in the past with, uh, where Nigerian um, Nigerian migrants were held in a particular prison. I think they were in, uh, I'm not particularly sure now whether they were in Libya, in Libya, held in a particular prison under some very horrible Detention inhuman process. conditions. And it didn't stop the flow. It didn't stop the flow of irregular migration, especially from the West African coast. And this will continue. But what we need to talk about is not even the stemming of the uh, illegal migration. It will continue. People continue to move. There are more migration, even irregular migration within the continent than people going outside of the continent. The statistics are there. More people are moving within Africa. But what we need to talk about is the subjection of these people to such inhuman condition, to such atrocity, to such you know, viciousness by state authorities or state actors in this part of the world. In Morocco, for instance. And so we need to start talking about how to enforce international human rights law against these actors. We need to talk about how to compel countries to obey the laws that they are signatories to. Yeah, but you see, the, the African Union is calling for an investigation into the deaths of these migrants, into what happened. So, you know, they are taking steps uh, regarding that. Um, I, I know that much. Uh, but then how do you keep these countries accountable? How do you keep countries like Morocco and even Spain accountable, because there are laws, like you said, there are international laws that they have to obey, and they can't turn anyone back. But then to treat people like this, how do we keep them accountable, and how do we make them accountable for what has happened at the border? Uh, for instance, uh, there are Nigerian citizens among the victims. There are, you know, 
citizens of other African countries, from the Horn of Africa, from other West African countries, we need to also, you know, uh, stand up for our own people. I know that this is about the time we need to get the Nigerian, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, we need to look at how many Nigerians are involved, how many Nigerians' rights have been violated. And when you aggregate all this together, countries coming together, there are other, there are other uh, um, platforms where we can compel Morocco to answer, to, to become, uh, to be accountable for their actions. Ms. Larry Barua, uh, thank you so much for speaking with me. I wish we had more time. Unfortunately, this is it. Uh, I did reach out to the Nigerian ambassador to Morocco. Uh, he said he would join me, and then at the last minute he bailed out. So hopefully we'll get him on the program uh, to talk some more about this. But thank you again for your time and for your analysis. Thank you. Anytime. Let's move on to our feature interview this week. On July 1st, the International Criminal Court marked 20 years of its existence at The Hague with the theme, International Criminal Court at 20, Reflections on the Past, Present and the Future. A court has faced accusations of racism and bias from African leaders, a number of whom have been indicted by the court. And now those watching are keen to see if it will take any action on atrocities allegedly committed by Russia in Ukraine through the invasion. But for us here in Nigeria, it is perhaps time to watch out and support Mr. Ibrahim Pam, one of the contenders for the position of registrar at the ICC. Mr. Pam is one of 11 other people and a third African out of four in the running for the job. I had a chat with him regarding the position and a few other issues concerning the ICC. My guest on the program today is Mr. Ibrahim James Pam. He is currently the head of the Independent Integrity Unit uh, at the Green Climate Fund in Songdo, Republic of Korea. Uh, but before that, he's had uh, other jobs as well, a very stellar profile. Uh, he's worked as a resident investigator, UN mission in South Sudan. He has also worked as chief investigations officer uh, for the Integrity and Anti-Corruption Department at the African Development Bank. He has worked at the office of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in The Hague and has also worked in uh, as program coordinator of Pact Nigeria and also at the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offences Commission here in Nigeria. And the list goes on. But now he is in contention. Well, he is right on top of the list uh, for ICC Registrar, and he's here to speak to us. Uh, Mr. Pam, thank you so much for making it on Diplomatic Channel. Thank you for inviting me. And I've just been trying to keep up, you know, with your profile. It's a... Uh, really impressive one. You've worked in a few UN agencies. You worked in Nigeria as well with the ICPC. You have your own legal practice. I didn't mention that earlier, but you've even worked in the office of the ICC prosecutor. So I would have thought, you know, that that would have been the position that you had been up for. Um, well, indeed, I mean, I did work for the office of the prosecutor. Um, but yes, I, I did not uh, seek to be the prosecutor of the ICC. Um, that position has been filled by a preeminent individual, uh, Karim Khan, uh, who's a Queen's Counsel, uh, absolutely um, uh, you know, perfect fit for the job. Um, and so, no, I, I didn't apply for that position. But would you be interested when uh, Mr. Khan's uh, time is up in the ICC? Um, in the same position. I know I expect to be retired before then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so moving on, why are you interested in becoming the ICC's registrar? So the um, position of registrar at the International Criminal Court is, is an eminent position um, which serves to uh, ensure that the court functions efficiently and and uh, with um, uh, and and helps to under under uh, to create cooperation among states and and be be the facilitator of of state cooperation. Um, the registrar position is a principal administrative officer of the court. Uh, the court is made up of three organs: uh, the registry, the prosecution office, as well as the judges. Um, and so it's a 
a very important position for the effective functioning of the court, and I believe that I have the requisite um, qualifications and experience to, to manage the office. My conversation with Mr. Ibrahim Pam returns after the break. Do stay with us. You almost seem overqualified to be vying for such an office. But you know that if you're announced as candidate for the position, I know that there are, um, there are others. You also have four other contenders from Africa whom they also uh, need to check out as well. They also have impressive profiles. Um, the, profile, the spotlight turns on you here in Nigeria. And, you know, these other contenders as well from Africa. Uh, the focus also turns to Africa if it does come uh, this way. What stands you out from the crowd? Well, let me say from the outset that I'm privileged and honored to be considered for the position. Um, I, I quite appreciate the fact that there are uh, other candidates who are you know, well qualified. Um, there are three other candidates from Africa, and I think we are um, each one well placed to, to serve in that position. Um, I'm, however, focused on what I bring to the table, um, and I think I have sufficient experience and qualifications to undertake the role of the registrar. Um, and, and that's multifaceted. Uh, it's not only in servicing the court and servicing uh, the judges, but also in creating the right um, environment of collaboration and cooperation amongst state parties. Um, exercising uh, a lot of skill in diplomacy and in, in consensus building, but also managing efficiently scarce resources, ensuring value for money, uh, and, and ensuring a safe um, a work environment for staff of the court. When you put all that together, I, you know, I do feel that I, I bring enough breadth of experience in all of these areas but also enough um, of my qualifications in doing the same kind of work in different institutions, including the ICC. So I, I speak for myself uh, with due respect to all other candidates, um, but I look forward to presenting myself for, for this position. You are re-entering an organization that some world powers are not signatory to, and some say this is probably why it is difficult uh, for the ICC to do its job. Do you think that certain reforms need to be taken in the organization? Oh, in fact, the ICC has undertaken a number of reforms. Um, and, and in this 20th year of the court, there has been already by the... By the um, Assembly of State Parties, there was a, an independent expert review panel that conducted a wholesome review of the entire court. And, and in, in its report, it's made about 360 recommendations thereabouts. Um, I look forward to taking that on. I think the court has committed itself to becoming um, a, a more efficient institution becoming a partner of, of choice for, for states' parties, um, bringing itself within the, the realm of the expectations of state parties, within the principle of complementarity, respecting the sovereignty of states, but discharging its function um, as, as the uh, a court of last resort. Um, and, and absolutely, there is a need for reform at various levels, reform of its prosecutorial strategy. The prosecutor is already doing that. Reform of the workplace. I currently chair the um, ad hoc expert advisory panel on workplace culture for the ICC. Um, and we've just delivered a report, about 171 pages, having interviewed about 180 uh, staff of the OTP. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, I'm absolutely on top of it, understanding the issues and having a plan for how to engage in that reform process. So indeed, yes, um, long-winded answer, but yes, indeed, there is a need for reform and uh, the ICC is working on that.
Can we talk about a few global issues? And I'm sure you're prepared for this. Analysts are already saying, you know, the issue of insecurity in, in, in Nigeria, of course, should be dealt with uh, using a multifaceted approach. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, why the legal angle really hasn't been explored. Do you think that these um, bandits, these insurgents, should be brought to the ICC to at least face um, charges of uh, crimes against humanity? I mean, because there's a lot of kidnapping. Um, there's uh, uh, banditry, there's killings going on, indiscriminate killings going on, and so on. Someone should be made accountable, you know, for these crimes, right? Oh, indeed. Um, and that's why the judicial system uh, functions, and that's why it exists. I believe that the uh, Nigerian state is sufficiently equipped to deal with the issues that arise from uh, the criminality uh, of non-state actors. Um, I think there has been an assessment by the ICC. I believe that the former prosecutor came to a conclusion in November 2020, uh, which was widely communicated. I believe the current prosecutor has been in Nigeria recently um, and has been speaking with, um, with the most senior officials of state. Um, Clearly, there is ongoing collaboration to that extent. Uh, and, and that's why I explain what the, what the principle of complementarity and, and what the twin idea of positive complementarity mean. And that is that the ICC supports its states' parties in um, addressing issues of, of, uh, that f may fall within the Rome Statute, of crimes committed within the Rome Statute. Um, and I think those conversations are ongoing. Now, I'm not privy to them, um, and that is not within the remit uh, at this point of the registrar. Um, it's the prosecutor's mandate to develop its prosecutorial policy, uh, which I think has been done. So I'd leave that to the prosecutor, but I believe the Nigerian state is actively engaged in the process of uh, criminal justice and bringing non-state actors who may commit Rome statute crimes to justice. What really are Nigeria's obligations to the ICC? We don't hear much about it. Oh, Nigeria's obligations are multifaceted. I think it's fair to say that um, Nigeria exercises great influence on the ICC. Um, out of the 123 states parties, uh, 33 of them are African, and surely Nigeria is the leading um, country in this regard in terms of its influence uh, regionally. Um, recently, when uh, the, the president of Nigeria was invited, President Mohamed Buhari, to deliver the uh, keynote address at the celebration of the ICC's anniversary, uh, I believe a year ago, a couple years ago. Um, and he did make very strong comments about the need for the ICC as an idea of international criminal justice to be sustained and for support from the African continent for the institution. Nigeria has been a rallying point for the ICC and, and um, that's really the obligation it has discharged. Uh, in addition to also providing leadership within the ICC. And so the former president of the court, uh, Judge Chile Ebo Suji, uh, a, Nigerian, uh, a Nigerian national um, who served with distinction on the court uh, and as president of the court. So indeed, Nigeria has played a very a sterling role in, in advancing the course of international criminal justice. Now, you know, I'm going to ask about Ukraine, right? So can the ICC intervene in the war on Ukraine? I mean, we're talking issues of war <coughs> crimes, crimes against humanity brought against the Russian government and Russian military forces. Uh, where is the ICC in all of this? Um, so as far as I know, the prosecutor of the ICC has announced the opening of an investigation. Uh, the opening of a situation in Ukraine. Um, and that's been done swo moto, but also based on the referrals by 39 states parties 
under Article 14 of the Rome Statute. So that's being done. Um, I believe the prosecutor's office has deployed investigators into Ukrainian territory. I understand that the prosecutor himself has been in Ukraine at least on two or three occasions. Um, so there is a whole flurry of activity ongoing by the ICC. Um, I'm not aware that it's targeted at this time at any individual or any particular country, but the ICC looks at crimes committed within the context of an ongoing conflict. And that's a really tough task to do, but one that is being done diligently and with uh, a great deal of uh, discretion and, and, and courageously. Indeed. Mr. Ibrahim Pam, thank you so much for speaking with me. I appreciate you joining me on Diplomacy Channel. Good luck, and I hope to see you in the ICC soon. Thank you very much. Nice speaking with you. And this is where we end the program this week. Thank you again for watching. And don't forget, you can reach me using any of the social media handles showing on your screen. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you next time.